welcome everybody, welcome family, friends, colleagues, uh, people who escaped the cold outside to sit today in, uh, inside here in the warm, uh, warm room. It's a very full house, it's nice to, uh, to see so many people here after having the past years not so many of these events, it's, uh, it's nice you, uh, you all came. I am Thomas Klei, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering and I'm the Pro-Rector today, so my role is limited to guiding you a bit through the procedure and saying a few, uh, few words uh, uh, before I hand over the word uh, to the person you came for. It's my pleasure to do that today. I chair this session in which uh, Professor Mark Wienans, uh, our chair in machine reasoning, will hold his inaugural lecture. He became uh, our chair in 2019, and after several COVID delays, we are now in the faculty catching up, and uh, we can celebrate together this uh, important moment in our, uh, our faculty. And I actually uh, didn't really expect him here. I kind of expected here to be some intelligent machine standing which would deliver this address and uh, yeah. Yeah, given the subject of his chair that this would not be a person anymore doing that. Uh, uh, we have recently seen also in our faculty uh, that all kinds of intelligent systems online actually can do assignments better than students themselves. So people turn in papers and things like that made by, by machines. So I thought yeah, that probably this, uh, this address would also be automatically done. but. No, apparently we are here, you are here, and also I have not been replaced yet by a machine, so there seems to be still a role for us in, uh, in this world, and uh, yeah, perhaps you will talk today about it, how long we still are relevant, and, uh, and when we, uh, as, uh, yeah, as deans and as professors, become obsolete and uh, will be replaced by machines. Your presence in this faculty Professor Wienhans uh, predates this faculty by quite a bit. Huh? If, uh, if you look back at, uh, at the records and, uh, and your CV, then you started as a student here in 1996. That's, uh, that's a long time ago. Huh? That's uh, uh, far before this faculty had its name, even far before the faculty had its previous name. And, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, long ago. You continued here. You uh, obtained your PhD in 2004. You went occasionally, uh, briefly, or a bit longer outside of the university, briefly abroad, back and forth, but uh, kept coming back to this, uh, to this uh, faculty. I became an assistant professor in 2009, and then 10 years later, 2019, uh, you became the chair in uh, machine reasoning. And if that's not all, huh, you like to play what I always say, the, the, the faculty bingo in positions. Yeah, for those people who were yesterday at, uh, at the faculty uh, meeting uh, realized what I referred to, you hold many, many positions. You have been educational program director in your time here. You have also, uh, uh, to check another box, since 2021, you are the chair of at that moment still DKE, the Department of Knowledge Engineering, in the meantime, the uh, Department of Advanced Computing. So you do many different roles, and this is the crown to all the roles. And yeah, we are curious what the next role is on your, in your bingo list of, of faculty, uh, uh, faculty positions. And yeah, if you look back, and I refer to it already a couple of times, uh, the department changed names quite often. Also, some people sitting here have, uh, have history in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this faculty or predecessors of, and it seems to be every time that, that, that Marx makes a move and, and does something else, that at the same time also the department changes again its name. Eh? So uh, it has been uh, indeed uh, now, now Ducks. Uh, last year it was still DKE. Somewhere before it was, was I have been told, MIC or so, the Maastricht ICT Competence Center. And I think when you were a student, it's still had again a different name. So, so every time you make a move, it changes. That, that cannot be coincidence. Eh? So uh, uh, be prepared when he moves to something again, then probably the name will change a year later. So you have seen this faculty develop for, for 26 years, uh, uh, probably longer. Hey, you have grown up in the region and have seen the university uh, uh, develop uh, uh, over time, have experienced uh, the transnational University of Limburg, uh, uh, of which we have uh, our, our opinions. Uh, uh, <laughs> you have, uh, yeah. Uh, worked with lots of people in the room. Uh, uh, I've been told that many of the staff, or actually all of the staff and students you know by name, huh? so we may test that at uh, some moment, uh, uh, <laughs> if that's really the case, because this is a big uh, room full of people. And uh, uh, yeah, it's an integral part of our faculty. So. Yeah, what, what else should I say? I think uh, in the past years we have really been building together uh, 
out on this faculty. You have been instrumental securing like sector plan funding for this university in computer science, what we uh, acquired over the past year. Some of the colleagues sitting uh, left and right of me actually uh, are being paid on that funding, so really on the basis of that. Uh, very busy pushing for a bachelor of computer science in Maastricht that will start in uh, September this year. And we have together, I think, many exciting plans, and I'm very much looking forward to continue uh, uh, building with you. It's now, I think, time to hand the word to you. And again, uh, you do it as a person, and, uh, but perhaps you made your speech uh, at least by some uh, uh, artificial system. We'll check that now and then. Maybe we can stop you now then and then ask an, a random intelligent question to verify that. Uh, so yeah, I think that's enough. Uh, uh, it's time to give the floor to Professor Wienans for his inaugural yeah, movie, or should I say, oh sorry, lecture, The Intelligent, The Artificial, and The Random. Professor Wienans, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pro Rector, for introducing me. Very nice. A highly esteemed audience. Today, I will deliver my inaugural lecture as professor in machine reasoning at the Faculty of Science and Engineering of Maastricht University. As you might have noticed, my chair will be located at the Department of Advanced Computing Sciences, which performs research in the domains of data science, computer science, applied mathematics, robotics, and artificial intelligence. The latter is the field I'm working in, and this will be the focus of this lecture. Uh, disclaimer before I start, this lecture has been mainly composed by myself and not by an, AI, not by an AI bot such as ChatGPT. Now, what is AI? AI, artificial intelligence, has become a prominent and growing research field in the last couple of years. It concerns building intelligent entities that act effectively and safely in a wide range of new situations completely on their own. We have seen many applications recently ranging from fields as diverse as healthcare, finance, law, insurance, communication, education, energy, transportation, manufacturing, farming, and games. There are several views on how to create these intelligent systems. Russell and Norvig define them on two dimensions, thinking versus acting, which both of them can be human-like or rational. This leads to four views on AI which are all valuable. The first one is thinking humanly. The idea is that if we can model the thought process of humans, then we can implement this model in our computer systems, which then will behave intelligently, just as we humans do. The catch here is that we need to have a thorough understanding how exactly we think or how exactly our brain works. These questions belong to different disciplines and are studied in the fields of cognitive science, neuroscience, and also brain science. Still, this view on AI has inspired several successful methods, such as artificial neural networks. The second view is thinking rationally. The idea is that if we can make correct inferences according to the laws of logic, intelligent behavior will emerge. The catch here is that we should be able to represent the world in such a way that it fits a logic notation to, per to perform these deliberations. This requires knowledge of the world that is 100% certain, which is hard to achieve. Next, it assumes that we have sufficient time to perform these careful deliberations in order to prove the optimal course of action. This is not always the case. Instead of focusing on whether and how machines can or should think, the question should be, can machines behave intelligently? If a system acts humanly, it's pretty smart, as we humans tend to be smart ourselves. Acting as a human is especially valuable if you would like to talk to chat with a computer system. When we, we would like to get a proper understandable explanation when the computer makes a decision. Instead of getting the answer, computer says no. When we design androids that have to act as a companion, we would like that they behave like us. But acting as a human also means making suboptimal decisions, which might increase the fun in video games and other entertainment, but is not so recommendable in other situations where safety or sustainability are concerned. 
in the end, for many applications, it does not matter whether the behavior is human-like as long as the job is being done. Airplanes do not fly as birds, but they do fly. And this leads to the fourth and pragmatic view of acting rationally. We don't care how the system thinks and whether it behaves as a human, as long as the system is able to make the right decision according to a metric that we humans have set. This includes societal awareness. Acting rationally does not mean clairvoyance or finding the perfect solution. The pragmatic aim of AI is to create autonomous computer systems that are able to make the best decision given the amount of information av available, given the limited amount of time, given the limited resources. What's the optimal decision in hindsight does not count. In hindsight, everything is easy. There are several approaches to implement these views on AI. The 2018 Dutch AI manifesto recognizes seven main subfields, whereas the sector image computer science is more cost drained by limiting it to three. And I will take the latter one as the starting point. The subfield of AI that is getting the most attention nowadays is machine learning, which allows systems to learn on their own by recognizing patterns in huge data sets and making decisions based on similar situations. It has had many noticeable successes in areas such as healthcare, financial trading, fraud detection, marketing, and natural language processing. However, another important component of AI is machine reasoning, which is a subfield I'm working in. We humans have something called a gut feeling. It's usually based on some past learned experience. But before making any rash decisions based on some gut feeling, it's wise to think it through. Is the, the situation really as similar as you think it is? Responsible decision making requires considering the consequences of an action. That is what machine reasoning is supposed to do for AI. Machine reasoning takes into account the potential follow-up actions based on the available information by gathering additional information in order to reduce the uncertainty of an outcome, by looking at viable alternatives and discarding the irrelevant ones. Machine reasoning involves, amongst others, uh, methods to search efficiently in general solution spaces. Machine reasoning should also be socially aware, taking into account the involved people and their preferences, which includes explaining the decision to a human user. The recent progress in machine learning challenges and stimulates the advancement of the field of machine reasoning as well, because there are many things AI cannot do very well yet. Machine learning methods do not understand the world at the same level as we humans do. These methods have difficulties to generalize to completely new situations. Humans can generalize from a single example by deriving cause and effect, where machine where machine learning struggles when the amount of data is limited. While machine learning is rather good at pattern recognition, it's not so strong at reasoning on a more abstract and general level. The next step in AI is the ability to, to apply learned knowledge to new situations. Combining machine reasoning and machine learning methods seems to be a very promising research direction. Further integration of these methods will increase the quality of automated decision making, regardless whether this is used to make the final decision autonomously or to provide a human operator with a wide range of sensible options. But where should we do this AI? Now, to test how well AI methods perform, we need to have a clean and safe test domain. Since the dawn of AI, games have been used for this purpose. The advantage of games is that they are widely available and that their rules are well defined, making them a great benchmark for comparing AI to human intelligence. The question of whether computers can beat humans in games like chess, Go or Stratego has been one of the first tasks that an AI system should be able to do. Even if machines surpass human grandmasters, games continue to be a great benchmark for comparing different AI approaches to each other. In games such as chess or Go, the number of possible positions is huge, making it infeasible to prove who wins the game. 
AI systems have to find the best line of play given the limited amount of time they have. Moreover, games offer all kinds of other challenges as one has to deal with other players whose strategies are not known. In some of them, it's not possible to observe the full state or the outcomes of an actions are uncertain, or even the environment can change at any time. Game playing is to AI as Formula One racing is to the car industry. The competitive pressure has led to new methods and insights in the fields of machine reasoning as well as machine learning. Big tech companies such as IBM or Google have been using game playing to test and showcase their advances in AI. Therefore, for my own research, I'm using games as well. Now, in game playing, the task is to find the best response to the opponent's moves, provided that the opponent does the same. The reasoning method for this is search. Here we look at a two-player turn-taking game, which can be represented by a tree, where nodes indicate states and edges indicate moves. The initial state is the root of the tree. Based on the moves you can make, the successor states are generated, in which it is subsequently the turn of the opponent. Because it is impossible to generate the complete game tree, the tree is being truncated to a limited search depth. At the so-called leaf nodes, a heuristic evaluation function is being used that gives an estimate who is ahead. Typically, an evaluation function is a linear weighted sum of features, such as counting the number of different pieces. In the past, these features were usually based on human knowledge and hand-coded by a programmer. Instead of handcrafting one yourself, already in the 1990s, Tesoro showed that neural networks, though computationally more intensive, can learn to estimate the value of a state by means of self-play. Now, after assigning scores to the leaf nodes, the values are being backpropagated by the so-called minimax principle. At nodes where it is the opponent's turn, minimax selects the move that minimizes the score. The idea is that the worse it is for you, the better it is for the opponent. In notes where it is your turn, Minimax chooses, uh, chooses the move that maximizes the result. Based on this analysis, the search chooses the move in the end and executes it in the game. Playing is nothing more than solving a sequence of these truncated game trees. For decades, this kind of heuristic search has been the standard approach used by programs for playing board games such as chess, checkers, and many others. Over the years, researchers have proposed many search enhancements for this framework to further enhance its effectiveness. The victories of computer programs against the human world champion in checkers and chess in the 1990s further sealed the reputation of heuristic search. However, this traditional approach has not been so successful in some other games. The prime example is the game of Go. This game is full of relatively vague concepts such as life and death, territory, influence and patterns. This implicit human knowledge is hard to turn explicit in a heuristic evolution function. Without such a function, heuristic search will simply fail. While in many board games, the level of play was at least at grandmaster level in the 2000s, in Go, the machines did not reach even a proper amateur level. Go was the tournament where spectators came to have a good laugh. Even if we don't care about Go, the general questions we are asking ourselves are, what do you do if you lack the knowledge to build an evaluation function? What do you do if you don't have the data to generate one automatically? What do you do if you don't have the time to generate or build one? What do you do if after all your efforts, the evaluation function still doesn't work? What do you do if you don't have a clue? You're going to gamble. You're going to Monte Carlo. Now, at the leaf note, a number of games are simulated by selecting semi-random moves until the end, where they are subsequently scored. 
the results of these samples are being recorded in order to calculate an average, also called the winning ratio. In this example, the score is 75%. In this way, the so-called Monte Carlo evaluation assesses the merits of a leaf node. The idea is that if there are many lines leading to win, then there is a good chance that a false win can be secured. If there are not so many winning scores, then probably the opponent has the upper hand. The same pr procedure applies for all other leaf nodes, and by applying minimax, the best line of play can be chosen. Now, you would wonder, this is easy. Why wasn't this done before, as Monte Carlo sampling dates back from the 1940s? Well, in the early 1990s, the first attempts were made to use Monte Carlo evaluations in chess and Go. Success was rather limited, as the hardware in those days could not support many simulations, resulting in a flat Monte Carlo search not able to look more than one step ahead. It was no surprise that sooner or later the ID would pop up again. At the moment, hardware would have advanced such that more simulations per second could be executed. It was Helmstetter and Buzzi who tested this approach at the Computer Olympiad of 2003. Their program performed reasonable, but it was not a breakthrough as they had hoped. Why does this Monte Carlo search not really work? Now, at the moment tactics start playing a role in the game, such an approach would easily start misinterpreting positions. Let us have a look at the following leaf note where we scored 33%. If we would zoom in here, we would see that for the first move, we are scoring only wins, whereas for the other two, we are only scoring losses. Under the assumption of rational play, we would simply avoid these bad moves, leading to an overall score of 100%, which would eventually, eventually lead to a different decision. How to solve this? You could say, let us search one step further, problem solved. But this would lead to an increase of states, leaf nodes, and therefore an increase in the number of simulations, which costs time. Time that we don't have. You could mitigate this by decreasing the number of samples per state evaluation, but the quality of the assessment of a game state would then go down. How to solve this trade-off? On the one hand, we would like to see as many states as possible. On the other hand, we would like to sample a state as much as possible. How to integrate Monte Carlo with search? The answer is simple. Instead of generating a tree first and then using Monte Carlo simulations to assess the leaf nodes, flip it. Simply flip it. Start with the simulations and build the tree subsequently. Let Random, be your guidance. <laughs> now, this concept is called Monte Carlo Tree Search, also known as MCTS. From the root, you start with your simulation. And by the way, this animation took me three hours to make. <laughs> the first state that has not been seen before is added to the tree. Next, the simulation is played out, scored, and recorded in the tree. In the example, we see that the tree is gradually generated in memory and steadily becomes better at estimating the values of the nodes. Yes, five seconds took three hours. This enables, from the root, a promising line is selected using the previously recorded information, which leads to a node expansion after which a simulation is played out and the statistics are updated accordingly. This cycle is repeated as long as there is time left. In 2006, Coulomb demonstrated the strength of using this MCTS approach by winning the 9x9 GO tournament at the 12th Computer Olympiad, causing quite a stir in the game AI community. Still, this MCTS approach was not without its problems. If we're going back to the example, we see that if we select the moves in a greedy way, by always going for the one that has scored best so far, we will never have a second look at the other root moves. This is the trade-off of exploitation and exploration. 
you would still like to spend time on the most promising lines, but still to put some effort in the seemingly less promising ones in order to prevent missing a strong one. Now, I have some business people here. Search is like investing in stocks. You put your money in the potential winners, though investing in some risky ones might pay off. A loser can be actually be a, be a winner. Investing in stocks is in a certain way gambling. Where do people know how to gamble? In Monte Carlo. And what do they have there in Monte Carlo? Casinos. And what do you find in casinos? Slot machines. Also called the one-armed bandit for those that have read Lucky Luke, because such a machine will empty your pockets really fast. The goal is to find among the slot machines the one-armed bandit that is giving you the best payoff as soon as possible. Because every time you pull an arm, it will cost you. This is called the multi-armed bandit problem, and essentially the same problem we are facing in MCTS. This problem has been well studied in the literature, and Kotlich and Svesvari proposed to use the multi-armed bandit algorithm Upper Confidence Bounds Applied to Trees, also known as UCT, for selecting moves in the tree. The first part of the formula focuses on exploitation by taking the score achieved so far into account. The second part deals with exploration by taking into account how many times an arm, a move, is being chosen relative to the total number of samples. The parameter C balances the exploitation and exploration trade-off, and this clean mechanism has become the way to go in MCTS. Now, at Maastricht University, we also got really excited about this MCTS. And for the last 15 years, yes, 15 years, we pushed this framework even further. In those years, I have supervised several bachelor, master, PhD students and postdocs who introduced several enhancements to strengthen MCTS. First, I had like 15, 20 add-ons that I would like to discuss, but I got some strict instructions. So I limited only to seven. Anyways, starting in the tree, the first issue we tackled is that a multi-arm banded selection mechanism, such as UCT, has no clue when only a few simulations have been conducted at a node. To resolve this, we introduce progressive bias, which guides the selection mechanism by adding some small offline generated piece of domain knowledge. In case such knowledge is not available, we have suggested progressive history. That takes into account how well moves performed elsewhere in the tree. These techniques do not solve the problem if you have hundreds of moves in a state. In such a case, it takes a while before every move is sampled at least once, which would mean that MCTS is not able to have a deep look ahead. We introduce progressive widening to deal with domains with a huge branching factor. This technique initially limits the move that MCTS can consider, but gradually increases the number of moves as the node is visited more because it is more promising. In general, it holds the more simulations you can run, the better Monte Carlo search performs. Therefore, you should squeeze as much juice as the computer hardware can provide you. As modern hardware contains several cores nowadays, search algorithms should be paralyzed such that they can make maximum use of the available resources. We investigated how so-called tree parallelization can explore different parts of the search space simultaneously in an effective way. It turns out that MCTS scales very well compared to other search algorithms. It's no problem if sometimes a result is recorded incorrectly due to some racing conditions. We are gambling anyways, we are making mistakes anyways, and Monte Carlo search can handle noise rather well. Next we looked into how we could get more out of these uh, simulations. The default is to, su to select the moves randomly, but if more sensible moves are played, the predictive power of a simulation increases. But how do you know what is sensible? Well, if you don't have a clue, you go to Monte Carlo. 
Here we propose the n-gram selection technique to bias moves on how successful a move pattern was during the other simulations. The tricky part is if you make such a strategy too smart, by removing the random element, the performance of MCTS will go down. This can be resolved by using an absolute greedy approach. It means sometimes selecting the moves randomly, sometimes selecting the move that has been the most successful so far. In addition, it's not necessary to play out the simulation until the very end. Although MCTS does not need an evaluation function, if you have one, you can cut the simulation short. If you know who's winning, you can stop the simulation and give the win to the one that seems much ahead. The better the evaluation function understands the position, the earlier you can stop the simulation. Now, after performing the search, the MCTS engine commits to a move in the game. In the next turn, or time step, MCTS has to search again for a follow-up move. Instead of starting from scratch, relevant information of the previously generated tree can be reused. However, this is not so trivial, as in dynamic environments, the world changes all the time. The information stored in the tree is no longer in line with the current state of the game. Still, it turns out to be useful to reuse this information to a certain extent, as MCTS is built to deal with noisy information anyways. Many more announcements for MCTS exist, but I'm not allowed to discuss them by us and others. The few I mentioned here already creates a nice Christmas tree. These add-ons are controlled by multiple parameter settings that require extensive and time-consuming offline tuning, which is not always feasible. Moreover, as the strategies of the opponents are unknown, or even the domain is unknown, the search engine has to be flexible. We propose a self-adaptive MCTS that uses a multi-arm bandit algorithm to find the right search control settings online. We learn how to search when we are searching. Machine reasoning in general has to be adaptive, as circumstances in which decisions must, must be made may change rapidly. Now you could wonder, Mark, what happened with Go? Simultaneously with the development in MCTS, deep neural networks emerged as a powerful tool to perform machine learning. Now the question arises, can you combine this machine learning technique with this reasoning technique? The Google DeepMind team took up this challenge in order to defeat the strongest human Go player. The procedure is as follows. A deep neural network learns from human game records in order to predict expert moves and to assess the value of a state. This neural network is then used to bias the selection mechanism and to improve the quality of the simulations. This approach is called AlphaGo and defeated the top Go player Lisa Doll in 2016, 10 years after the dawn of MCTS. Now you could wonder, could this also work if you have or you don't have this vast amount of data in the form of human game records? if you have zero knowledge, zero information, zero data? The answer is, if you have no clue, you go to Monte Carlo. You use Monte Carlo Tree Search to generate the data to train the neural networks. By letting MCTS play against itself, game records are generated representing a decent level of play. As the neural network learns from these games and is integrated in MCTS, the level of play of MCTS will increase, which means better games are played, better data is generated, the neural network learns more, and MCTS becomes even stronger. In the end, it leads to a neural network that already plays at grandmaster level of around 3,000 ALA points. Nevertheless, as you see in the histogram, putting MCTS on top of this leads to an additional increase of 2,000 ALA points. MCTS corrects the mistakes of the neural network. This approach, called AlphaGo Zero, which means zero knowledge, outperforms the original one as well. Besides Go, this procedure has also been used in chess and Japanese chess, achieving superhuman level. 
This is a prime example of the breakthrough that can be achieved when a reasoning technique such as MCTS and a machine learning technique such as deep neural networks are combined together. The MCTS taught the neural networks a lesson. AI that teaches another AI. So far, we saw applications in two-player turn-taking games such as Chess and Go. At Maastricht University, we investigated applications of MCTS in a wide variety of game domains. A natural first step is to look at puzzle domains, also known as single agent search. There we showed that MCTS outperforms classic search algorithms, such as A star, in complex puzzles, such as same game. On the other side of the spectrum, there are games with three or more players, so-called multiplayer games. These domains are challenging as the optimal strategy depends on the preferences of the other players. In many of these domains, MCTS outperforms other multiplayer search algorithms as it plays a mixed strategy. Also, MCTS is successful in domains with uncertainty due to partially observability or chance. A successful application has been in the domain of Scotland Yard where our MCTS engine outperformed the commercial Nintendo bot. As a testimony of its strength, this MCTS engine has been used as benchmark to test Google DeepMind player of games bot. The biggest challenge for search algorithms are actually real-time games. These are noisy environments as the world changes while you're pondering your next action. Classic video games such as Super Mario or Pac-Man are great benchmarks as one has to make a decision every 14 milliseconds. Here, MCTS is also a feasible technique, as shown by our MCTS Pac-Man agent, which you can see over there, which achieved the first place out of 36 competitors in 2012. And by the way, it will clean out the complete level, but I don't have the time for that. AI, in the end, should be able to perform different tasks in different environments should be able to manage itself and possess the, comp the competence to perform any new task that it has never performed before. And this includes playing multiple different games. Since 2005, several general game playing competitions have been organized where bots have to play several unknown games on the spot without any human intervention. This means that programs cannot rely on game-specific and prior knowledge and have to adapt to each new game, and therefore have to adjust their planning. MCTS engines have been performing relatively well in these competitions. Even in the general video game AI competition, where bots have to play arcade games. Though the amount of thinking time is limited, our MCTS bot, of course, won this competition in 2016. Now you could say, Mark, are you only playing games? Can you only use this for games? I have wasted my time today. MCTS can also be used beyond games. For example, together with AUKUS, we have developed an MCTS planner that optimizes the production times to, uh, for surface plating jobs. In the video, you see some racks and baskets for kitchen cabinets being processed. Such a job scheduling problem may involve 6,000 jobs for a production line with 110 machines. The goal is to plan thousands of jobs such that the production time is optimized. This is a challenging problem, not only because of the sheer number of possibilities, but also because tasks can change every day. Rescheduling has to be fast. This MCTS planner uses several IDs originating from Game AI, such as single player MCTS, same game. Progressive History, Shiny Checkers, Havana, Tree re Reuse, Pac-Man, Tree Parallelization coming from Go, and Combining Neural Networks with MCTS also coming from Go. This is not an academic exercise. The resulting planning system has been implemented and been operating in several production plants controllers since December 2018. But there are many more. There have been many other MCTS applications in a wide range of domains. For example, a potential application that we investigated together with RWTH Aachen is looking for suitable combinations of bearing elements 
in the, in, the, in the domain of structural engineering. The European Space Agency showed that MCTS is an order and magnitude more efficient on interplanetary trajectory planning than other methods. Other applications are planning chemical synthesis, patients and admission scheduling, real-time path planning for unmanned aerial vehicles, autonomous robot exploration gathering, energy management and parking utilization. Unfortunately, this is not used here in Maastricht yet. Amongst others, claiming that game AI is nonsense, is claiming that AI is nonsense. And by the way, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, there were a lot of people claiming that AI was nonsense. Also at this university. My statement. <laughs> Anyways, I have a confession to make. I, misled, I have misled you. I misled you in giving you the impression that we have a general purpose planning algorithm that can play any game, schedule any job, plan any task, and outperforms humans and other software at any time. There is no free lunch. There will be some free drinks afterwards, but there's no free lunch. Generic MCTS engines, even with their domain independent add-ons and self-adaptiveness, might perform well in some domains, but are subpar in others. Many of the MCTS engines I mentioned are specifically built for their specific problem and exploit the underlying domain-specific structure. A lot, of, a lot of specifics. Moreover, to outperform other search techniques, many of these successful MCTS engines are hybrids, integrating components from other search approaches in order to perform as strong as possible. MCTS is simply a building block. In many domains, MCTS is a contender, but not a winner. Classic search algorithms such as A-star or alpha-beta are still going strong in certain domains. Other Monte Carlo approaches are in the lead elsewhere, such as nested Monte Carlo search. But then again, the dream is to have artificial general intelligence that is able to do any task which can build a car, act as a judge, and in the meantime write a poem in Italian, tells a story, form insects, and is able to plan for any domain. Should we accept that this broad AI is always outperformed by some narrow AI that has been, de been, de been designed for a specific task, for a specific search problem? Or should it do what we do if we face a task that is too intellectually challenging? We build a narrow AI to deal with the problem. AI that builds AI. AI that creates search engines. Designing search engines consists mostly of con combining existing concepts and tuning them, which is a mechanical process and can be automated. As a first step, we propose the uh, adaptive general search framework, which would consist of a portfolio of existing search techniques. They are subsequently decomposed into their building blocks, which then are encoded in some formal description. This enables the AI to investigate all kinds of combinations to generate a new search engine for the problem at hand. Of course, it would not be able to think out of the box. Fundamentally, new concepts would still be provided by AI researchers for the time being. This may not be a free lunch, but it might be a cheap one. There's one question that has not been answered, which has been bothering me for the last 20 years. 20 years. As shown in this following video clip from 2002. Computerspelletjes zijn voor nu bij telecomputers kijken. 
Op de computers Olympiade worden het halve bekende computergames tot minder bekende spellen gespeeld. Dus uh, het zal eigenlijk echt zijn. En ze doen het op het in een groep vormen. En dat moet zelf doen. Uh, het doel is natuurlijk aan een wachtschuif als zin in lijn zet. Dus zit dan op dit moment twee wachtschuif. Je mag niet over uh, zit van de tegenstander spelen. En uh, je mag wel over de eigen spelen. En op dit moment is mijn programma al voor het ene of twee uur al aan denken. Dus ik hoop dat hij zo klaar is. Ja, is het dat. Er gebeurt wel, er gebeurt wel van altijd met. Echt een stift, echt een kruin, echt een stift, echt een kruin. Tijdens de Olympiade speelt de mens een ondergeschikte rol. De computer te denken te zetten en de deelnemers voeren ze gehoorzaam uit. Toen zit er zo te kijken van dat doet niet meer. Nee, voor je blijft, want soms mag je het niet meer. Ja! And this has been the question I've been asking. What is it doing? What did he now? <laughs> Why did this search make this move? What is happening? Answering these questions is already hard for the deterministic search engine that is using a classic human designed evaluation function. It's even a bigger challenge for a modern method like Monte Carlo Research, MCTS. Simply comparing winning ratios between moves will not tell you much. Looking at their main lines will reveal that the scores are all over the place. As the deeper you go down in the tree, the less the states have been sampled. These scores are coming from Monte Carlo simulations, where moves have been chosen by some absolute greedy strategy. And these simulations have been cut short by a state evaluator based on some deep neural network. And we got there in the first place by some biased UCT mechanism which also had to, had to take into account parallelization. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, these parameters controlling the search could also have been tuned automatically online by some self-adaptive mechanism for the fun. And even the search itself could have been designed by another AI system, yes. And by the way, in the future, MCTS could even run on a quantum computer. Yeah, which is a challenge in itself. Is someone still following this? No? That's great to hear, because I'm not following this myself. This was the point. Even if AI behaves in a rational way, it has to be human-like in order to explain what's going on, in order to be transparent and trustworthy, which contributes in accepting their solutions. These aspects are studied in the field of explainable AI, which usually focusing on explaining the decisions of machine learning methods, as some of the successful ones are black boxes. The outcome of a search is not trivial to explain as well as it is a complex tree consisting of many promising lines. The subfield of explainable search aims to overcome the gap between the search result and human understanding. The human user would like to get answers to the following questions. Why? What exactly could happen next? Which possible outcomes were explored? How were they interpreted, compared, and selected from? At Maastricht University, we're also going to investigate explainable search. And in our view, it consists of two parts. A mining part that aims to extract the relevant information for, from a search tree, and a storytelling part that aims to create an explanation, either story or dialogue based on the information extracted. As the search can be executed in an online setting, the explanation should be provided together with the decision without additional delay. The biggest challenge here is answering the question, why not? As you can't analyze everything in the limited time one has. How can you explain something that you could not investigate properly? This is the trade-off between explaining and doing the right thing. If we aim for the best result, we have to compare uh, or we have to compromise on the explanation and the other way around. What will this trade-off look like? How can we extract relevant information from the search such that we can generate a proper explanation? These topics will be addressed during my farewell speech in 2045. <laughs> yes. Anyways, the last remarks. 
In the past, I was the program director of the nowadays called Bachelors in Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. In this program, we have so-called project-centered learning, PCL, where students work together on a challenging task. In the Netherlands, every six years, programs are being assessed for their re-accreditation. Here, we received the following praise from the assessment panel in 2020 that I would like to share. The program explicitly aims for its students to acquire an international academic orientation. It combines the PCL approach with an international classroom in which different backgrounds are deliberately mixed in project groups. What were these deliberations? Taking into account the time and re resources are limited at a Dutch university. Which policies were in place so that such an international classroom could be achieved? What do you do if you don't have the data? What do you do if you don't have the time? What do you do if you don't have a clue? You go to Monte Carlo, you randomize. And that was what we did. Dare to randomize. It seems artificial, but it will make you more intelligent. Finally, I would like to share my uh, words of sincere thanks. And uh, by the way, I wrote a whole list here, but I'm not allowed to discuss them because I don't have the time anymore. Uh, so I will use the, the, the brief one. Um, I would like to thank the Faculty of Science and Engineering for their support and confidence in appointing me as a professor in machine reasoning. Next, I would like to express my gratitude to all my colleagues and former colleagues of the Department of Advanced Computing Sciences, formerly known as the Department of Data Science and Knowledge Engineering, formerly known as the Department of Knowledge Engineering, formerly known as the Maastricht ICT Competence Center, which is a descendant of the Faculty of Algemene Wetenschappen. Hopefully, I didn't forget one institute. For their support over all these years. Especially, I would like to thank everybody who helped me with organizing this event and providing me with material for this inaugural lecture. I've been honored to work with so many excellent researchers as, at this university and elsewhere, providing me with new ideas and insights. It has been a privilege to supervise so many outstanding bachelor, master, and PhD students, as well as postdocs, who explored all kinds of new research directions, which I was not able to do or did not dare to do. I would also like to thank the members of the Structural Committee and Advisory Board and my PhD supervision team for being here. I would like to thank the audience for attending my inaugural lecture and enduring my speech. I hope it wasn't that bad. Next time, use an AI board mark. Okay, good. <laughs> and to slot, I would like to thank all of them for all their steun. Zonder ik had ik hier niet gestaan. Ja. Dixie. Ik heb gezegd. I have said. Yes, thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk. It was very nice to listen to. I noticed that about half of the audience have left on their way to Monte Carlo because they think they have uh, <laughs> found a way to uh, to win tonight. So uh, for, for those who uh, stay till the end, uh, we have learned that it's a bit more complex. So we, we just gamble on having a drink, uh, a drink instead, I think. Uh, so thank you very much all uh, for being here. Also people uh, who uh, might have been listening online. Uh, this brings us to the end of uh, this session of today. That means that uh, uh, we uh, will, do, uh, will leave the
the area first and make our way to the raft for a drink. You can congratulate uh, our professor uh, there, but I recommend that you don't wait in a very long line in the cold hallway, but just grab a drink immediately and find him sometime later, because it's, an, uh, it's a big full room here, so it will take long standing there, it's very cold there, so go to the warm area, get a drink, and you'll find him either now or, uh, or if you stay on for the night party, then uh, tonight. So I thank you all very much, and with that, I, uh, I close the session.